started, I just wanted to take a moment and thank Ina May and Dr. Price for coming all the way out to see us. Um, we're going to take a few minutes and do a Q&A with some questions that were submitted prior to the event. Um, Sarah will be reading those questions with us, but if we ask that if you have any questions, maybe wait to the end if we have any time. We might be able to take a couple, but I think we're going to be kind of squished to get all the good ones in because we have lots and lots of interest to get those questions answered. Um, if you guys need anything, at these doors and to the left is the restroom, and then the emergency area. Thanks. Okay, the first question. What contribution that you have made to maternity care are you the most proud of? Hmm. Well, that's a big one. That's a big one. But I guess the just putting stories out there, women's real stories, was important. That mattered a lot to me um, because if it's just your experience, uh, what do you know? You've never had a baby before, perhaps, and um, you might have some little feeling like that might work, but how are you going to know if you don't hear from other women? And so I just had that opportunity that presented itself, you might say, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I just learned a lot from listening to other women. And uh, when I first was pregnant, you know, I, I couldn't have thought of having a home birth. It was unthinkable. And I simply didn't know that all of my ancestors had been born at home, all of them, including my parents. But did they tell me their story? No. They were Methodists and Presbyterians and you just didn't talk about that sort of thing. That sounds weird, doesn't it? <laughs> but, so, I think just putting the stories out there and then finding to my shock that that was the first, one of the first books that was out that uh, dealt with birth. Amazing. Dr. Price? Well, I, I think, you know, this is a question that, um, it, it's, it's a little bit personal as well because it, it makes you stop and kind of think about what that is, what that impact is that is important to you. It's very, it's very much personal. But I actually got a text this morning from a physician out of Nashville um, where I ran the hospital for three and a half years before I uh, assumed this position. And she, she was gushing about a birth that she had done today um, with preterm twins that went skin to skin in a, in a procedure where everybody stayed together, uh, where the whole team came together and gave that mom the exact birth plan uh, that she was looking for. And she just wanted me to know that all the work that I had done there is sticking, that change is possible and you can excite teams that we don't traditionally think of are the teams that champion this, but you can do that. And we've now done this four times. And so we know that it's possible. We know that we can excite the teams to own this, to, to begin to love birth, to move away from really high intervention, and to be incredibly excited because you're giving someone the birth she wants within an environment that's suitable for that particular need for the patient. Um, so I think that's probably what I'm most proud of is that I've been able to, to kind of move to a place where people think it's hopeless to drive change in the healthcare system. It isn't. And we've demonstrated over and over that you can do that very, very successfully. Um, just by you know staying positive and being uh, persistent about that. So that was a, the best text of my day. One of the questions that came in uh, is what is our best approach to empowering breach birth? Oh, the best approach is for people to keep understanding that that it's a skill that that's necessary. Um, even when, I think a lot of people don't understand that even when the birth is by cesarean, you still have to bring the baby out breech quite often, you know, so uh, why, uh, why do we forget, you know, that with three to four ba uh, births being breech, uh, this has been happening forever, and that if you lose the skills, uh, you've lost something precious because Sometimes those breech babies are going to come fast. Um, it, I uh, think this, that uh, when you lose skills, it's sad. 
uh, because if you, you know, I think of myself if I were a young medical student, if I never had the opportunity to see it, and now we're in an age of technology, we have so many f opportunities to show films and, and uh, you know, work with mannequins and all kinds of things, uh, and with people in different positions, whether they're, they're standing or they're, you know, on all fours, it, we should be using everything that we have and, and maintaining skills and realizing that sometimes you're going to need a C-section and there's no shame in that, but we really ought to keep, uh, keep skills alive, okay, for each generation because, they're, you know, it's just, it's important. Yeah, and, you know, in my facilities, the midwives to breach births, um, because it is part of the realm of normal, and it, um, it's always surprising to people when we include that as part of a skill set, but people roll in the door all the time breach, and we need to know how to do that safely. So there's a normalization component, right? And I talk a lot about the arbitrary concept of normal. So we, we say that midwives should be doing normal birth. Well, what's normal? Pre-E is completely normal. It happens all the time, every single day. And, and we should be learning how to manage that. Um, so there's that concept of what's normal versus what isn't normal. The second issue is that we're faced with a pretty daunting physician shortage um, in the next 20 years or so. Um, we're seeing fewer and fewer people going into obstetrics, um, which is not a good thing. Um, we need great obstetricians. Um, higher risk birth is expected to grow by 11%. And so that is not a great uh, balance to have. So as we move forward, we have to have open conversations around what we're teaching our medical students and what type of medical students we're attracting to obstetrics. Um, it tends to attract people who are um, very, um, they're not the best communicator. Sometimes the easiest patient to coerce is a pregnant woman. Um, and so it tends to attract two, di two different types of people, people who love this and who love birth, and then people who find it very easy to kind of convince that patient of, 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 patient of, of what they want them to do. So I think the reform starts at the medical school level. Um, from my end, from the hospital side, there's a lot of work being done around understanding that the, this generation that's giving birth today, the, you know, the, the much younger women now, grew up in an age of technology. They're comfortable with technology. Um, when I walked into birth room, the last thing I want to see is technology, but they, they feel better when there are computers and technology and things that help them. So I've been working on what is the technology doing to promote normal birth and to promote optimal outcomes because it's currently completely inadequate. So there's a technology component to it, it safeguards and then promotes a normal outcome um, on top of that as well. What is the funniest moment that you have ever experienced at a birth? Well, there have been quite a few of them. But <laughs> one that comes to mind is a couple having the first baby and they were, um, they worked together. They were always together because they were, um, you know, working in a, a, some kind of a group home situation with, with adolescents there and, you know, so he was familiar with the kitchen, he could deal with things in the kitchen. And they had this sort of ideal image in their head that they would just be gazing lovely, lovingly in each other's eyes somehow and, and they did that for a little while but then she needed something else and she took off and she went upstairs leaving him alone wondering what to do with himself. And she was uh, up there looking out a window and enjoying watching a squirrel, you know, playing around with the tree. And I had to sort of let him know that he wasn't failing her in any way, that um, sometimes you just need to do what you need to do and that she'd be back at some point. And uh, he, he eventually came downstairs. Now I had something for him to do because she wanted to sort of sit and lean back a little bit and I thought, well, he could, he could be holding her here, uh, behind her be sort of the you know, birth chair guy. <laughs> and so, uh, but what happened was that gradually, every time she pushed, he got farther and farther and farther under <laughs> the mattress. And then when she pushed that baby out, um, and he came out between, well, his legs first. <laughs> Um, he said, I feel, I feel like I've given birth. <laughs> so, 
that one was pretty funny and we all had a, a pretty good laugh about it. It's great. Well, it's funny because we, um, we picked up Ina May today and we've had a lot of time in the car and we were rehashing crazy stories um, and poor Sarah was in the back seat just trying to keep up with it. But I remembered one today and it makes me laugh today. I had a, a woman who came in and at, clearly advanced labor with her doula. Um, I knew her well. I've been taking care of her. Um, and I could tell that she was near in transition, so it was kind of rushed. And her husband was sitting to the left of me. I had a nurse trying to put stuff in the computer, and her doula was standing with her. And I checked her, and I clearly had a breech male baby. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had my finger still inside her, and I leaned over, and I said to her husband, I have a penis. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> we're going to regroup after. We're, we're talking about a breech baby. So, I don't have to. Can't let that one down. Choose your words wisely. <laughs> okay, ladies, how do you protect yourself from burnout? And what are your thoughts on burnout in the birth industry? Okay, well, burnout in my case is not allowed <laughs> in, in some sense. I mean, I was always on for, from 1970 to whenever, 2016 or so. And, um, but uh, sometimes it was protected, I suppose, because I traveled, okay, so sometimes I wasn't around and that in a way, uh, I guess, was some kind of protection. Um, I'm not sure that anybody that works within, you know, a hospital setting is going to be able to kind of relate to what it was like to just have started something that I had to keep watching over, but then now and then I was gone. So I think that that, I'm not sure that helps you all uh, to know how to do that, but it, I guess that helped me in some way that I was, sometimes I was, there and having intense um, births and all that goes with that, but then there were other times when I was talking about it, and I suppose that that was something that that helped. But if I were, you know, a, a home birth midwife working now, I would I would certainly know how to say I'm scheduling some time off. I'm scheduling some time that I've got a family, I can't just neglect them. And so you have to be able to say, um, that's not going to be a time when I'm active. You, know, you have to have some time when you stop and take a breath and be good to your family, be good to yourself, and, and you know, integrate what it is that you've taken aboard. Because I think sometimes when you go, I'm going to be a midwife and I'm going to change the world and you can, you can get um, crazily euphoric and you're going to, that's going to hit you in the face in some way. It's better to you know, bring yourself to being very real about what it is you're doing. You're not going to, uh, you, you're going to affect things in what, in, within a sphere of where you can. And sometimes you're not going to know what are the things that are most helpful until you take time back to um, reflect and learn from what's, what you've already been doing. Yeah, I, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, I think there's a, a component of trauma that sits in burnout. I think a repeated exposure to trauma and not processing it. So sometimes what you identify as burnout is really a trauma response that's unresolved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, this really came to light. I was at the ACNM uh, conference this year, and somebody, a speaker presented on birth trauma. Came out of nowhere, a huge audience. Um, and she brought up really specific examples, and we'd all witnessed those. And we were in a space where we weren't guarded. We weren't in the birth space where we put that in that, that, that other place in your head. And I mean, we were just, people were crying. I mean, it all came out. Mm -hmm. and. I didn't realize how much I was carrying um, from that as well, and um, particularly when I was vulnerable and I didn't see it coming. 
So I think it's important that you separate out what you're willing to do, right? I always talk about, don't ask me about my work-life balance. I get to decide how much I want to work and who watches my kids. It's really not anybody's business. Everybody has an idea of what that needs to be for them, um, which is another component of it, right? Other people's expectations of how much time you're spending at work and the pressure that comes with that. Um, and then there's a component of how do you deal with every day? How do you make sure you work through those things that, that are burdening you? Because most people go into this field because they love it. There are jobs that you can do if you don't love it. Where you check in at 8 a.m. and you leave at 3, you don't have to love it, you can just do it. But in this job, if you don't love it, you're going to harm somebody, emotionally or physically uh, sometimes. So um, flesh it out and figure out if what you're calling burnout is just, in fact, um, how you feel because you've witnessed so much stuff that you haven't processed yet. And if you work through all of that and you still feel completely burnt out, then you have to honestly ask yourself if this is the career for you. Because it is a 24-7 job and uh, you have to love it. This is a question for Dr. Price. How do midwives navigate an increasingly medicalized maternity system? So this kind of goes back to what I said earlier around the, th this random assignment of what normal is. Um, we can normalize a whole bunch of the stuff that's currently considered medical. What I, what I see happening in midwifery is actually the opposite. 25 years ago, people were fighting to keep higher risk patients, right? They didn't want to hand them off to anybody. What I see today is people are very quick to hand off a patient when they have a risk factor. And that's destroying trust with women in the community. The minute you say, oh, sorry, you're 36 weeks and five days and I can't take you as my patient, uh, that's a huge issue for somebody who's built a trust base with you. So first of all, I urge for midwives to be autonomous. So we need to keep working on the state level for autonomy for midwives. Mm -hmm. CPMs and nurse midwives need full scope practice uh, within their scope and their training so that women have access um, to immediate care. Um, who want to not be in a medical setting but may have a medical condition. Um, we need to expand the midwifery force because with the shortage of physicians coming up, midwives are going to fill the gap. But at the end of that, in order to bridge these relationships, because we know that collaborative partnerships and relationships are what works best for the women who have the highest risk factors, um, at the core of that, we have ownership in that. Because what sometimes happens as a community of midwives is that we put ourselves in the bucket of other or alternative and separate ourselves from a system that's been incredibly frustrating to work within. I urge you not to do that. I urge you to keep going. Make sure that not during a transport situation or a volatile or difficult situation, but in the times where you can have really good positive conversations that you keep chipping away at the relationships and building those bridges so that we integrate in the system because that's where we're going to do the most good. Um, women who birth out of the hospital tend to have fairly uncomplicated courses. It's the women who are coming to the hospital that, that really get separated from a holistic care model. And, uh, and so that's what we have to work on um, you know, as a collective workforce of midwives to make sure that we insist that we are integrated, not insist that we are different. And I do believe that obstetrics and midwifery are different things. I don't think that midwifery is obstetrics light. I think it's a different profession and different philosophy and a different skill set. And that actually is recognized by the medical side, right? It's recognized that there's a skill set midwives have that doctors don't have, um, and that that can be taught and that can be mutually beneficial. And that's where the excitement is. Um, and, and so I think there's a really bright future for that, but we all have to roll up our sleeves and be willing to keep trying to bridge the divides that are there. And that's what's going to benefit women, and that's what's going to demedicalize some of those things that are now um, you know, pretty medical but don't need to be. And then again, I think we need to focus on new technology and what's in the wings. Our technology is so antiquated that it actually directs how we birth in a hospital, right? You can't get up, you can't do certain things because our technology doesn't support it. So we really need to be uh, thinking through what an ideal state would be and then push for that um, and challenge people and say this is inadequate and I need something that works better for our patients. Because that's a different conversation. If your tools aren't working to support optimal hands-off birth, you know, I, I have dreams at night where I see a woman walk in the room and the room goes, the fever heart tones are 176 and her blood pressure. It, nothing touches her, right? There's nothing there. But you know, think big around that because we're just bogged down by what is existing, not what could be. And all of those things need to intertwine um, to the best of both worlds. Okay, the next question is for Ina May. 
In what ways do you believe faith and spirituality affect laboring women? Well, I first birth I ever saw impacted me so strongly in that way. I thought, okay, I, I know what Holy Spirit means now. That's very real for me. And I saw the most perfect birth that I, I can imagine, you know. And, uh, well, it's, it's a mystery, you know, birth. And we're not going to, we shouldn't have the illusion that we're going to sort of pick it apart and, and you know, come to the depth of that mystery, but here we all are, you know. How could there be so many people if this wasn't meant to work? And it wasn't necessarily meant to be easy either. On the other hand, it can be so very easy, okay? But how can we predict what it's going to be for any given woman? We may not be able to do that. She may not have a feeling about it. That's also part of the mystery. So I think we have to, uh, we go, could this have all happened randomly? I seriously doubt that, you know? And, um, well, the more I, there, there's, you know, Psalm 139, you know, you know, I praise you, we're, we're so fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, that's quite a phrase, that, so fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, it's, when you look at it, I mean, even there, if there's some little little thing with a baby that's unusual, but still, I mean, you look at everything that is right, uh, you get a, a whole different feeling about it. I was in <clears throat> Germany, I was in Paderborn, Germany some years ago, <clears throat> and uh, a young mom was there and talking about, and we were talking about the spirituality of birth. And she said, well, she had a question for me. She said, do you think the fact that I was very, very angry at God, that it could have been why I labored for three days? <laughs> I think it's possible. <laughs> could be. <laughs> you know, and so when you're in a sort of praise and gratefulness mode, okay, you can have the same physical factors going on, but now you've got something that's a gift, you know, and not a an oppression and a, and a horrible thing, you know. So that's one of the, my favorite things about birth is just to watch mom, if she was feeling sorry for herself in any way or agonizing over something, and then when she comes to that point, I mean, I remember a woman that said, uh, this was a young woman in Nashville. She said, I was agnostic until I had my baby, and then I felt the hand of God on, on my back. And it was so comforting. Okay. Now, how do you explain that in simply materialistic ways? I don't, I don't think you can. Yeah. The next question is for Dr. Price. Recently, there have been gatekeeping measures taken by local hospitals to restrict doulas from offering services to clients. Do you have a professional take on the impact that these measures will have on maternal mortality, morbidity, and PMAD rates? Do you have any suggestions on how to navigate these new policies in order to work collaboratively with care providers so that doulas can continue offering support to birthing families? Well, I think hospitals have no business telling people who's at their birth. Um, I think that is the decision. Uh, we don't do that in any other specialty, right? Mm -hmm. um, I hear this all the time. I, I've been asked that many times in my career, um, but it, it doesn't come from any place other than wanting some control of the room. So I think people should have those with them who they most want at their birth, as long as they're affirming and it does really great things for them. So currently in the U.S., about 6% of women have a doula. 94% of women don't have a doula. And where we're seeing um, adverse outcomes and higher mortality rates are in the women who don't have a doula, um, not in the women who do have a doula. So I don't think it has an immediate impact on the maternal mortality rate because that's not where it is. The women who are educated, hiring doulas, bringing them in, um, have advocacy at the bedside. 
um, they, those women are arranging that with their doulas. They're, it's a team effort. So how do we get support to women who don't have resources, who, who don't have advocacy, who are by themselves, who have one of the five major risk factors um, you know, for, for a high mortality rate? That's really the question. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Ina May, the last question is for you. What do you see for the future of home birth, and what improvements do you think are necessary going forward? Well, looking at you know the situation that we're in, which is ever changing and you know getting harder and harder for a lot of people, um, gas prices going up, you know people, um, you know various kinds of transportation. I live in a very rural area. I mean. This is metropolis for me to be here in Memphis. <laughs> I was so glad I wasn't driving. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> and because uh, this morning I got up and I got on my bike and I rode down the hill and I went around and you know it was up at 6:30 or so, just me and the and the critters that are out there. Sometimes I see wild turkey. Sometimes I see a a cat that didn't make it across the road, but <laughs> and I'm unlikely to see another human being. Okay, so that's where I live, <laughs> and so there's a lot of people out there. I think that if you live in a, in an urban area, you don't realize how much of this population is scattered in the middle of the you know the, so what they call flyover country. But it's you know most of us don't fly. <laughs> over it, you know, we try to get around it. So um, people have babies out there. People have babies quickly. Um, I'm interested that the, some of the Amish community that I left behind when I moved from Middle Tennessee to West Tennessee had caught here before I had. I hadn't known they'd moved here, but I found them out by accident because I looked over here and I go, that's an Amish house. I go over there and find out, oh yeah, she used to attend births and that one who's standing here selling vegetables, uh, you saw her when she was, uh, came without clothes because she was just born, okay. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be, more and more midwives are gonna be needed. I think that's just a given. And we need to be reaching out to the, the people you're going to have to transport sometimes. So you need to build those relationships and, and reach out, you know, learn, learn skills, you know, take your EMT courses and, and um, prepare yourselves. Get on a farm if you've never been one, been on one and, and you know, watch some goats be born. Um, you can learn things by you know being around, I mean, we, we get to watch cows give birth sometimes. You could um, think of all the ways that you can reach out and make relationships because I you got to make friends with doctors. You have to not uh, be condescending about your relationship with them. Primary and, care. Yeah. And you really have to understand what it is that if you had been in their shoes, what what you would have first scene of birth. It might not have been pretty. Mm -hmm. And then your primary care physician, the growth of primary care again. So exactly. Relax. Primary care physicians are so important, you know. And I'd, I'd sure like to see more family docs um, able to do C-sections and, you know, you don't have to have everything be a level, you know, the highest level hospital. I'd like to see us be a little saner about that and have more, you know, care so that you don't have people in um, certain, I mean, you can't think that everybody's got the same climate. And, you know, if you're in hilly country or mountainous country and you've got winding roads and then you have some seasons where it, the sleet comes, the snow comes, you don't want people hurrying to get down, down below to a city and then they have a car accident on the way. I mean, this doesn't make sense, so we have to really get to know the less known parts of our country and cherish everybody who's out there and help, help them have what they need. So that's gonna take, um, it's gonna take people reaching out from those rural areas 
we're going to have to have people helping people to live healthy lives. But I want to see more gardens. I want to see more people growing food. Find somebody old who knows how to grow food. That's, that's a way to deal with your diet if you know. It's not just taking pills, you know, it's teach your girls and, and boys how to cook um, and fix things. You know, it's just, it's a part of life to be competent at the things that maybe your great grandparents were skilled at. Um, if you have any elders who are around, pump them for information, you know. Um, while you can, you're, you know, those of you who are really quite young, I mean, some of you, you could be my grandchildren very easily, if not great-grandchildren, you know. Um, just a little note here, my, my grandmother, for whom I'm named, um, was born two years after President Lincoln was assassinated. It's quite a while back. <laughs> but she, she got on a bike and, and rode to Chicago to go to a Bible college. I think that's where she found the brain. But, you know, they know things. I, I, there's so many things that I wish I'd ask. And, uh, well, I'm just, I wish somebody had told me earlier, ask more questions, be curious. Because old, old people actually many times will be very happy to tell you things that you like to learn. Learn how to write cursive. Teach your kids how to write cursive. It's, it's important. Why is it important? So that you can read. I mean, you could even read the Constitution in the original handwriting. So I like all that kind of stuff. That's brilliant. Yeah. Okay, for the last segment, even though all of these questions were submitted by folks around the world, we thought it would be best to end with you guys asking a question of each other. Uh, and so, Ainame, if you have a question for Amber uh, that you would like to ask, no. um, you're welcome to do that. I think that you had a note, and I had a note, but what was I going okay. to ask you? No, we oh, can... what was the biggest obstacle? That's exactly right. That was what you wanted to ask oh, her. Yeah, my brain worked. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest yeah. obstacle no, to becoming a, you know, a midwife, and then, I mean, when you first became a midwife, did you ever think that you were going to be a CEO? No, I was going to, like, wear dreads and work in New Zealand. <laughs> no. Which I did. Um, and I, you know, I come from home birth. I was born at home. Um, I was a home birth midwife. I worked in uh, out-of-hospital birth. But my journey evolved without any thought around ever being in hospital leadership whatsoever. That evolved because I started to develop a love for in building infrastructure. So as I started going to rural communities and realized there was nothing there, there were no foundations or relationships or infrastructure, um, you get creative, right? I worked in a, in a birth center where we put a laundromat in because we realized people didn't have well water. And so once we had a laundromat, people engaged in their care. So I love that. And, um, and once I fell in love with infrastructure and moved away from the bedside just a little bit to, to make sure we had great care for the community, um, it just evolved. So no, I wasn't planning on doing that. I don't have an MBA. I don't have an MHA. Um, you know, there are very few uh, senior executives or hospital CEOs who are women. Only 14% nationwide are women. And many of those work in tiny hospitals, particularly in a, a large healthcare system. It's very rare to find a woman a CEO. But that's who drives the culture. Um, and that's, you know, where, where the decision making lies. We know that women make 80% of healthcare decisions in this country, and yet healthcare is led by people who don't relate to the people who make the healthcare decisions. Anything from color choices to how you provide care and how we communicate and what consents look like and how we include people in, in care and how we integrate things. That's not that they don't care, it's just a very different perspective that I bring with me. And so as I moved up, I, I was very successful in the places that I was able to build infrastructure and engage uh, and drive great outcomes. That got recognized, and then it was just yeah, by osmosis I moved on. But the biggest obstacle in that truly is um, in the business world this gender equality and the perception that you, you know you're not a businessman and you're not you're not you don't fit in the mold of what a CEO needs to be. I still encounter that all the time. Um, you know, I, and, and it's one of those things where you have to work three times as hard and be three times as um, impactful and effective and successful. Uh, before people trust that you um, are a business person as well um, as driving that care. 
And as part of that, I am unapologetically a midwife. Anything you look up for me, any publication, anything I've done, it will say CEO, midwife. Um, and when somebody says, take that off your email signature, I make it bold and I make it bigger. I have always um, been very clear that my philosophy of care comes from being a midwife. And that philosophy lends itself beautifully to the patient experience, to building integrative care models, to bridging relationships with the clinical side. Um, and the rest I just learned along the way because I, I worked in health systems that were supportive of doing that because it worked. Because the things that I said I was going to do and build worked out well. Um, and like I said before, you can sustain them um, at the same time. So I, I went through a convoluted path of all kinds of weird different degrees to glue that together and the education I needed. Um, but it, it works great. I, I think when I look around, I don't see anybody else. There's nobody in my rearview mirror. Um, I, I see, you know, kind of the same echelon of, of leaders coming up through the pipeline. So I highly encourage you, if you're interested in leadership, think about it, um, because our philosophy of care lends itself beautifully to where we're leading healthcare for the next 10 years. Dr. Price, do you have a question for Ina May? Well, uh, yes, because the last time I was with Ina May, out came, comes this story that I have never heard before from the farm, and, and you know, I would love for her to share that story with you. And the question uh, that prompted it, I believe, was something around what, what did you guys do for birth control on the farm, right? Because there were hundreds of women and, and men living there. Um, and then she told me this story. So I'm going to ask her this, the question again, like how did you practice birth control naturally? And uh, what did you have in place to prevent pregnancies? <laughs> well, in the beginning, <laughs> nothing at all. And so the babies just happened, and they happened fast. And and fast and furious, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> and Carol's here. I can attest to that. But, uh, well, I happened to live in the same house as the woman who became interested in this situation. And you might not know that it, it was not known um, for a long time what was the, the time of maximum fertility. I mean, the woman's uh, you know, fertility cycle was not very well understood and there was a, a, a I think he's Swiss, uh, Dr. Volman who really studied this and it, so it came up through you know, Catholicism, you know, where you weren't going to use any sort of birth control other than what you would call fertility awareness. And so, now we, we were in the days of you know, no technology, okay? So how did you determine um, how, what your maximum fertile time, and what would be the time you know, when you would ovulate. Well, you, you took your temperature and you, you had a, a little thermometer that was not like a fever thermometer, right? And you would, you would insert it in, in your, in your what? <laughs> Rectally, I believe. Yes. yes. Uh, obviously, I wasn't very good because <laughs> I was, you know, had the midwife schedule and that made me you know, at risk in certain ways because if you're up, if you, if you don't have regular sleeping hours, that can disturb your cycle. Uh, however, you, and you also checked your cervical mucus, okay, so it goes through a change, you know, and, uh, uh, and then you had, you charted this on your little calendar. And so I, I lived in the same house with the woman that, that studied this. And so she would get the phone calls of, uh, do you think it's okay tonight? <laughs> so go, I think you really, um, you're gonna have to wait. <laughs> and, so you have, and I learned that there are people that have shorter cycles, there are some that are wildly irregular, and, um, and then you have some women that you can't trust them because they'll find some way to cheat on their um, their method <laughs> to be sure that they'll get pregnant, you know, and so those husbands actually had to learn um, to be take over at that point and be the restraining. <laughs> I learned all kinds of stuff from that, but I, I can say that he, it got pretty finely tuned, you know, and um, and that many people could really um, feel ovulation and. And it was a good thing for you know the young women to learn um, at, before they're you know sexually active. 
uh, because they can, you know, you, you can know your body more, and you can also track the way. Are you know, are you an, a nice, calm person through that whole cycle, or do you, you know, is it good if you kind of get away from people for certain <laughs> raging days when you're not good company? Um, these are realities, and so I learned a lot from you know living in the same house, and I recommend it, you know, because. There's a good feeling to you know, okay, I didn't take this, this thing that I regret ever having taken in order to, you know, and, and it's hard to stop. I mean, you can go, there's fertility crisis and, you know, you hear dire things, and, but, you know, there's a lot of people where I'm sorry, you know, it's just easy for them to get pregnant, you know. And so it gives you respect to know, uh, you know, how easily it can happen with, some folks, and there you go. Thank you. I have this image of this poor woman getting calls all through the night. <laughs> <laughs> Frantic phone calls. That was... <laughs> Is it okay? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do we have time for more questions? Um, no. Okay. All right, guys, we have only a couple more minutes. Do either one of you have any kind of closing thoughts or a last a thing you'd like to leave the audience to think about? I think when you have so much technology available, it's easy to get slack in thinking that it's going to solve so many problems. And I think, or that, you know, doctors are so highly trained and they have so many letters behind their name and, you know, it's all so professional and so on and so forth. But I think that we have to think uh, carefully about our lifestyle coming up and, and how we raise our kids and let, let's let them be active and, and um, let's teach them how food is made. I mean, I think that's very important to get, you get your kids knowing that where food comes from and, you know, try growing something and having respect for what it takes to get food to the table. And then also uh, making it taste good, you know, I, I remember before there was fast food. I'm pre-McDonald's. <laughs> I remember when there, were, there wasn't such a thing as fast food. I'm that old. Okay. <laughs> but that was good because you can look back at certain um, times, you know, in you know, the 50s and go, look at everybody's looking rather fit, you know. And that's a good thing, you know. So it's it takes, it, it helps just to know when to stop eating or how big that, you know, when plates got that big. Um, and if you came up in a family like mine, if it was on your plate, you're supposed to eat it. Or somebody's supposed to eat it, so. Um, I'm just saying, restraint is a good thing. And movement and, and being, you know, teaching the kids to be, um, have activities that that help them move. I think that's really important too, because that to to have the most um, sort of tumultuous thing that your body's ever going to do, and then be compelled to hold still, doesn't that doesn't make use of the equipment that you were born with. Dr. Price. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, evenings like tonight, I am energized when I see so many people who who are so passionate about normal birth and about advocacy and making sure that we're doing the right things. The questions reflect that, right? There's a concern about high-risk care. There's a concern about where we're headed in the future um, and where you contribute. But um, everywhere I go and speak, I see rooms full of people just like you who are out there advocating mm -hmm. for normal physiologic birth. As long as there are midwives, as long as there are people passionate about birth, birth will thrive. Normal birth will mm -hmm. persist. Um, it just takes an integration in a system that's rapidly medicalizing everywhere, not just in birth. Um, the medicine is really rapidly advancing. For those of you who don't know, we've cured sickle cell now. You know, I mean, and the, and the way that we did that was through gene editing. And so the next thing around the corner will be diabetes, and after that it's pancreatitis. And, you know, so it's a rapidly changing field. Um, but birth will always be a normal physiologic event. And the way I talk about birth, when I explain it to hospital CEOs who are like, why, are you, why do you build your structures the way you do, is that birth isn't a knee replacement. 
The way we approach a knee replacement is we do the same thing over and over. We know what equipment works, what medication works, what the, what the rehab looks like afterwards, and you get better and better and better and better at it. And birth is always individualized. It comes with an image that's in your head from the time you're a little girl. Being afraid of birth versus not being afraid of birth is in your bones from the time you're small um, and, and what you've been exposed to through your life. So we have to keep this a one woman at a time, individualized, molded to that person and her wishes um, um, every single time. Um, it does fit within the current system. Um, continue to work on building relationships and bridging and integrating into the healthcare system. And that's where we'll be successful. Thank you so much. to get some books signed if sure. people haven't been able to get their books signed or just to meet and greet and meet these two wonderful women who have come all this way to see us. So thank you again so much for coming. Thank you so much.